Rina Polanco Ventura, and I am the Director of Public Health Initiatives for the Partnership for Maternal and Child Health of Northern New Jersey, which is providing today's program. Our webinar today is entitled Breastfeeding Among Individuals Living with HIV, a Reasonable or Unreasonable Option. This program has generated a lot of interest and it would not be possible without funding from our FEMER HIV program. I would also like to thank Joanne Phillips, Simone, who is the educational specialist at the FXB Center at the School of Nursing at Rutgers. Without her guidance and support, this webinar would not be possible. So before we get started, I'd like to review some important information. The speakers and planners do not have any conflicts of interest to report for this program. Immediately after this webinar ends, as well as in an email, you will be invited to take a post-program evaluation please fill that out when you receive it because we do appreciate your feedback. To receive a certificate of completion, including one nursing contact hour and one L-SERP for lactation, you must uh, log in, listen to the entire webinar, and complete the evaluation survey. Certificates of completion will be sent via email within one week of the webinar broadcast. And this program is being recorded and will be available on the partnerships website and YouTube channel no later than January 19, um, 2024. So we'll be on for a while. We will be muting all attendees' microphones during the presentation, but we would love to hear from you. So please feel to write, uh, please feel free to write in any questions you may have as the speaker is presenting. And at the end, um, I'll take those questions and we'll conduct a short Q&A and the speaker will respond to as many questions as time will permit. Now I would like to introduce today's speaker. So we have the pleasure today of having Dr. Judy Levison. And Dr. Levison is a professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. Dr. Levison has vast experience working in private practice as an OBGYN faculty. And since 2002, she has led the Harris Health System Women's Program, which provides obstetric and gynecologic care for women living with HIV in Houston, Texas. She is active in educating Texas healthcare workers about the management of HIV, and her work in this area has led her to consult on projects across the globe. Her group is the first in the U.S. to develop a curriculum for group prenatal care for women living with HIV. So thank you for joining us today, Dr. Levison, and take it away. Great. Thanks so much, Irina. And thank you for inviting me. I wish I could see all of your faces, so I'm just going to imagine them in front of me. As many of you have gleaned, the concept of breastfeeding and HIV in the United States has been somewhat controversial. Um, first of all, I have no disclosures. Objectives today, um, by the end, I hope you can explain the reasons for the recommendation in the United States for individuals with HIV to not breastfeed, uh, to list the criteria for identifying persons with HIV who may be candidates for breastfeeding, and describe which individuals who do not have HIV may be candidates for pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP while breastfeeding. And I just want to make a comment about terminology. When I refer to women in this talk, I am referring to pregnant or lactating persons and recognizing that um, not all people to whom um, this subject is relevant uh, identify as cisgender women, women. And when I say breastfeeding, I'm also including chest feeding by individuals who may not identify as having breasts, such as transgender men. So pregnancy and HIV. Where are we in 2022? I'm going to give you a little history. So just to go back to where we were in the early 1990s before we had antiretroviral therapy for pregnant women, transmission in the United States was about 25%. Then someone got brave in the mid 1990s and said, okay, what if we give zidobinine or AZT to pregnant women while they're, while they're pregnant, in labor, and then give the baby medication after. And the transmission dropped to 8%. That was a 60% drop and was a huge leap forward. Someone then said, well, what if we did elective cesareans on everyone um, who was on AZT and um, like we do for someone with herpes? Um, 
trying to avoid the uh, viral contact. The transmission dropped to 2%. There was a, so there was initially a sort of run to do cesareans, but around the same time, combination antiretroviral therapy. So that's more where we have more of a cocktail um, with several drugs, three or four drugs in, um, in a single regimen. Um, and we found that even without cesarean, we could drop the transmission rate to under 1%. And the other thing is that um, we, we found out that transmission was directly related to viral load. And that if a woman, what was known by 1999 was that if a woman had a viral load less than 1,000, the likelihood of transmission was extremely low as compared to, you can see, uh, when you get over um, 100,000, uh, this is looking at women who got AZT and who didn't. And clearly the AZT made a difference, but the biggest difference was with viral load. And what we know now is that um, after following 8,000 mother baby pairs from 2001 to 2011, a French group then looked at um, the 2,600 among those 8,000 who where the mothers had been on antiretroviral therapy prior to conception, had undetectable viral loads prior to conception, throughout the pregnancy, and at delivery, and there was no perinatal transmission. So we can say to our women who come in to us on already on antiretrovirals, if they're doing well, and we can say you just continue doing what you're doing, there is no chance that your baby will be born with HIV, which is also um, a great relief to many of our mothers. And then there's breastfeeding. And I was first introduced to this issue um, in the early 2000s when I made a trip to Swaziland, which is now known as Eswatini. And at that time, there was controversy in low resource countries about whether formula should be recommended or not. And the concern was that breastfeeding, with breastfeeding, there is there some risk of HIV transmission through breast milk. And this was a woman who was caught in that net of controversy. She had just given birth and had heard that maybe formula was better. And I went with the project coordinator to visit her in the hospital and she was sitting with her baby in her lap and it was maybe third or fourth day postpartum. And she had a can of formula powder next to her bed, but it was already um, a fair amount of it had been used. And the, the program coordinator knew that the woman had been diagnosed with HIV during pregnancy. Her, she most likely had gotten it from her husband, but when she went home and told him, he kicked her out and she had no source of income. She was going to be going home to live with her mother who also was not employed. And there was concern that she might not be able to, um, to afford formula long-term. So it just, it just brought home to me, ooh, what a hard decision. So that again, this is now early 2000s. We've come a long way since then. So, what are the perinatal guidelines? So the, um, there's a national perinatal guideline panel that meets monthly throughout the year and, and usually at the end of the year comes up with an, um, the most updated version of guidelines. And so this was finalized on December 30th of 2021. So this is pretty much hot off the, the press. Um, the current wording is that the standard recommendation for individuals with HIV in the United States is to avoid breastfeeding. In other parts of the world, exclusive breastfeeding may be recommended, and I'll explain a little more about that. However, there are situations where persons with HIV in the United States will choose to breastfeed for social, cultural, health, or financial reasons. So what's the thinking behind the guidelines? Prior to the availability of, of antiretroviral therapy, the risk of HIV transmission just from breastfeeding was 16%. So a baby born without HIV um, who breastfed for 
from a mom who was not on antiretrovirals had a 16% chance of acquiring HIV. So that was why there was so much concern initially about breastfeeding moms. But then they found that in low resource places, many babies were dying from malnutrition and diarrheal disease. And the caveat then was if formula is available, feasible, affordable, safe, and sustainable, such as in the US, then not breastfeeding usually makes sense. And just to give you um, a, a graphic on um, sustainability and affordability, I was in a cafe in Habaroni, um, Botswana, early 2000s, and you know how in the middle of a table, there's the little container that has the sugar and the creamer and things like that. And I looked at a package of creamer and on it was printed, this is not for infant nutrition. And I realized that this warning was on there because probably more than one person had gone to the grocery store, seen the price of formula, seen the price of coffee creamer, they're both milk substitutes. Why would you spend so much more on formula than on coffee creamer? And there clearly were babies who had been fed with coffee formula and who probably did not thrive. So those were some of the dilemmas that people were, were having when they couldn't afford formula. So what are the risks of, of formula feeding? And then we'll get to the risks of breastfeeding. So as I said, the low resource countries, there was the, uh, there has been documented higher infant death with formula. And so that made everyone rethink that early 2000 recommendation for formula for everybody. And then in the late 90s, one other piece, which um, is not exactly intuitive, is that there was a study done of mixed feeding, meaning moms who both breastfed and formula fed. This was prior to there being antiretroviral therapy for the mom. So these are moms who had high viral loads. And what they found was that there was more transmission of HIV among the moms who were doing the alternating than moms who exclusively breastfed. So that was somewhat surprising. And there are two different theories that are out there. Um, the original one was, well, maybe it's because you give the baby formula. Formula is not exactly physiologic. And those of you who have um, used formula for their babies or have worked with women using formula know that sometimes you have to go through a few different formulas to find one that, that doesn't cause diarrhea or doesn't somehow cause the baby to be distressed. So the idea was you give formula first, it's not physiologic, you chase it with uh, HIV infected breast milk and um, the HIV then hits the inflamed uh, cells in the baby's gut and uh, wherever there's inflammation, HIV goes and HIV makes its way into the baby's gut. So that was theory one. The second theory was that it had more to do with the maternal breast, that if you're not consistently breastfeeding, you're going to have more engorgement. Where there's engorgement, there is inflammation. Where there's inflammation, there's HIV, and that there, uh, there was then more HIV in the breast milk. So we really don't have an explanation um, for this, but also, and we need to remember, this was before there were good antiretrovirals, but uh, so everyone sort of said, okay, so if you're gonna breastfeed, then it should probably be exclusive breastfeeding. So, Let's look at transmission rates now that we have antiretroviral therapy. What is the evidence? And there are three major African trials, and I'll just go through with you just so you understand what some of the concerns have been. And this was done in um, antenatal clinics in a few different countries in, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. This is a typical antenatal waiting room in a clinic. So the first one, the Keisha Bora study, looked at treating the mother while breastfeeding, so mother only. So they, they uh, gave the mother triple therapy, so good combination, until she stopped weaning at about 20 weeks after birth. And what they found was the women who were maintained on triple therapy had a transmission uh, risk of 5.4%, which was less than where they had given the baby just 
um, some medication during the first week of life. So it was 9.5%. So it looked like, hmm, keeping the mother on medication seemed to be helpful. They were not doing viral loads because they didn't have them available, but just, just in terms of prescribing and what happened. So that was saying, hmm, looks like treating the mom while breastfeeding makes a difference. And this was before lifelong therapy was recommended. So this was, many women were stopped, and even in the US years ago, we would often stop women if they had good CD4 counts after, after pregnancy. And this was a, a part of the study, this was in Botswana, the, in their lab, they were doing all kinds of studies, including looking at viral loads, in, or at least, I think there they were doing some viral loads on breast milk, um, but it was certainly in their major study, they wasn't consistently checked in the moms. So then the um, Mabana study, um, they, they looked again at maternal treatment, they had three different types of maternal treatment, all quite reasonable. And um, the moms were on it throughout breastfeeding, and there was only a 1.1% transmission rate. So here they had the feeling the moms were taking the medication a little bit more. And um, if women had undetectable viral loads, then the, there was a higher chance that of, of no transmission. So again, one more vote for maternal treatment while breastfeeding. Then one more study, the BAM trial, they said, well, let's compare, um, what if we kept the baby on medication, on prophylaxis, kind of like post-exposure prophylaxis or pre-exposure prophylaxis uh, throughout breastfeeding, and let's compare that to the mother being on full therapy. And what they found was there really was not a huge difference. Um, and they also had a control group that just got that one week of, of medication. So infant prophylaxis was 1.7% transmission, uh, maternal therapy was 2.9%, and that was not statistically significantly different. And whereas it was 5.7% in the control group. So it seemed like, hmm, keeping the mother or baby on made a difference. So WHO in 2010 said, okay, here are our guidelines for your countries. You can decide which one, treat, treat the mother until fully baby's fully weaned or treat the baby. And most countries went with the former, with treating the mother and actually went on. So it was called option B, and most countries went with option B plus. And B plus is not only keeping the mother on while during pregnancy and breastfeeding, but keeping on for life. And that's pretty much what the standard has become in um, most of the world. So now let's get back to the United States. So who wants to breastfeed in the United States? And I'm gonna give you a typical, um, this is just a composite of many people that I have seen. Um, in our population in Houston, the majority of our women who want to breastfeed um, um, are African, but we're seeing women in other groups also starting to request breastfeeding. But the classic has been 32-year-old woman originally from Nigeria was diagnosed with HIV during her current pregnancy. During prenatal care, she communicated to her obstetrician her desire to breastfeed. And the reason was that she feared that not breastfeeding would raise suspicion in her community about her HIV status. And here in Houston, we have a large Nigerian community, Cameroonian community, Ethiopian community. And the concern was when an auntie would come over on Sunday afternoon to see the new baby, if the baby wasn't put to breast, was this really a red flag to the community that the mother had HIV? So the patient was referred to the local pediatric HIV specialist to explain the risks of HIV transmission via breastfeeding. The patient expressed relief to discuss her concerns with her provider. Knowing she had options provided a space for her to contemplate the best decision for her situation. She opted to breastfeed for six weeks, both to prove to her community that she didn't have HIV and in response to the public messages that uh, breast is best. So she remained on antiretroviral therapy and her baby remained on prophylaxis while she breastfed. And just, I had one woman tell me she was terrified that if she didn't breastfeed, she would be ostracized from her community because if she had HIV, um, none of her friends would ever be her friends again. And there would be no children allowed to play with her child, even if her baby was just HIV exposed. And so, I mean, it's a really big deal. So 
one of the questions now that comes up is, does U equal U? And so what we mean by that is we know now that if a woman or an individual has an undetectable viral load, they cannot transmit HIV to a sexual partner. And that's what's usually referred to when we say U equals U. CDC has said this since 2017. And I think the general public is not fully aware of this. So someone newly diagnosed with HIV, whereas before, or someone with HIV, maybe they're dating and they want to tell a partner, um, I have something to tell you, I have HIV, um, now can say, I have something to tell you, I have HIV, but I can't give it to you. And that's a real game changer. So we can say that for sexual transmission. We now can say it during pregnancy if someone has been on antiretrovirals and has an undetectable viral load throughout the pregnancy. And if somebody's diagnosed in pregnancy but started early, we can say very low likelihood, extremely low likelihood of transmission. Um, but then comes the question of postpartum and, and um, of breastfeeding. Um, in terms of women who are HIV negative, um, they are more vulnerable to acquiring HIV during third trimester and postpartum period. So if they have a partner with HIV who's not well controlled, that's an issue. And then in terms of breastfeeding, we just are not at the point where we can say U equals U. Um, and women have to do their own risk benefit assessments. What we know now though is, um, as I said, that before we had antiretrovirals, it was a 16% transmission. Then with antiretrovirals, before viral loads were followed carefully, looked like a one to 5%. Okay, lower, but hmm, still some concern. The most recent data is that there's a 0.3% and uh, transmission rate at six months, 0.6% at 12 months. So that would be three per thousand and six per thousand. So out of a thousand moms who breastfeed, with undetectable viral loads, three out of a thousand uh, in the first six months, the baby might acquire HIV. Um, and as I said to you, from the pre-antiretroviral therapy era, exclusive breastfeeding appears to have a lower risk than mixed feeding. And we don't know if that really holds up now with great antiretrovirals, but um, nobody So I'm really going to do that study to find out, I'm afraid. Oh, what do we do? Um, learn from our really need to open the door. Our do a problem for you. Being, looking at what do we do if we based our study. I'm getting an echo back. Um, that if somebody is using IV drugs, then they're going to use, but we could make their, their using safer and provide clean needles, um, bleaching stations, things like that. And so I certainly don't want to um, equate breastfeeding with HIV with um, IV drug use, but just the concept of, oh, you're gonna do something that maybe isn't our first choice, but, but if you're gonna do it, let's let's make it as safe as possible. And um, the the, idea behind risk reduction uh, strategies are that people will make more health positive choices if they have access to adequate support, empowerment, and education. And so rather than driving our women underground and just saying don't breastfeed, and we would rather they do it with knowledge and approach it with the the safest, safest, way, safest ways. So um, as of 
December 30th. What do the perinatal guidelines say? In the United States, infant formula feeding is a safe alternative to breastfeeding in individuals with HIV. Breastfeeding presents an ongoing risk of HIV exposure after birth because suppressive maternal antiretroviral therapy significantly reduces but does not eliminate the risk of HIV transmission through breastfeeding. Therefore, breastfeeding is not recommended for individuals with HIV in the United States. And just this, this paragraph alone has gone through several evolutions in the last few years. Um, and um, just I will tell you that in 2015 was the first time the guidelines had one sentence just saying that women might express an interest in breastfeeding and that it needed to be addressed early in pregnancy. And then in 2018 was when we, uh, for the first time, had an entire section on uh, breastfeeding and the um, the references at the bottom of the slide the and that's hivinfo.nih.gov which is the guidelines and their guidelines for pediatrics for adults and for perinatal um, and just some other things that that are mentioned now in the guidelines is that you know there are reasons people may choose to breastfeed and um, among 93 U.S. clinicians who provide specialty care to women with HIV and completed a survey, one third of the providers were aware that women in their care breastfed their infants after being advised not to do so. Um, and I certainly know some clinicians who until fairly recently, they were aware that they had a few uh, women who were breastfeeding and the clinicians were terrified that anyone would find out because they thought they would be sued for malpractice. And in some states, women have been approached by CPS for breastfeeding with HIV. And so we're really trying to get away from that. And so this is what the section in the perinatal guidelines looks like. And um, this was a huge, a huge deal that the panel members were willing to acknowledge, even if they didn't agree with it, but acknowledge that there, that there are individuals who do want to breastfeed. So what, what, what do we tell, tell women who choose to breastfeed? Um, we say one, continue your antiretroviral therapy, maintain a consistently undetectable viral load, exclusively breastfeed, um, continue in infant prophylaxis, and I'm, I'm gonna explain this a little bit more, but the minimum of AZT for four weeks with possible nevirapine daily until one week or one month after complete weaning. Monitor maternal viral load every two months. And this is just a guess, but in our well-controlled women, often they aren't having viral loads checked any more than every six months. But if they're breastfeeding, we're encouraging them and their clinicians to check the viral loads a little more often. Test the baby at the standard times and one, three, and six months after weaning. And the um, British HIV association guidelines are very much in tune. We, we kind of have been in parallel um, updating our guidelines each year. And one other area of just controversy for the pediatricians has been, so what should the pediatricians be recommending for the babies? Um, there are no studies showing that Treating the mother and giving the baby long-term prophylaxis is any better than just treating the mother, but we know that treating the mother alone works. We know that treating the baby alone works. And so the, the three different scenarios that we've seen so far across the country, we're in the process actually of collecting um, cases from about eight to 10 sites to find out just exactly what everybody is doing because we're kind of making it up as we go. Um, but what we're aware of so far is in some sites, they're just saying, give four to six weeks of AZT and then just keep the mother on medication. Um, our pediatricians and several others in the country have said, you know, we know it's harder for women to stay on meds after they deliver, they're sleep deprived, they have other kids to take care of. We know that, that we've, we've documented that sometimes viral loads will go up postpartum. We would rather keep the mother on meds and um, after the first four to six weeks of AZT, give nevirapine, which is well known, a very commonly used uh, medication um, around the world and has been used in babies quite a bit, um, keep the baby on a prophylactic dose, not, not full three dose therapy, but just prophylactic dose until one month after 
um, baby has been weaned. And then there's a group in Canada who what they did was they put the baby on full treatment with three full therapy drugs um, while um, while breastfeeding. And there's no evidence to say that that's better. Um, it made them feel, I think the clinicians feel better, but just to know people have done that. So to make it work, uh, we learned that clearly we need to be collaborating with our uh, with the mother and uh, with our pediatric team. Um, we started. We worked first with our uh, infectious disease pediatric group, and um, they understandably. I mean, they had a lot of reservations about it, and and they they said, well, you know, we understand if a woman's going back to her home country where she might not have formula. You know, we we that we could agree with, and. But once they said that, they realized that, you know, I said, you know, it's not it there. Some of the same issues exist in, in the U.S., I mean, ranging from financial, but especially the social, just like in Africa, they can't be seen um, not breastfeeding. So same thing in the U.S. And so um, what we do is um, our women have a counseling session with us and then we make uh, we arrange for them to have a counseling session with the uh, PDID people while they're still pregnant. Um, we also learned the hard way that um, we had to make sure to include the nurses and the uh, pediatricians in the hospital because at the time the mother delivers, the pediatric ID people are not there and it's the general pediatricians and the um, neonatal nurses. And so we just had to explain to them that there might, may be select women who um, have undetectable viral loads, who have opted to breastfeed and that um, that they have our support. So um, we did some in-service um, education sessions to get everybody on board. The one other thing we've done, and this is not a legal agreement, it's not a contract, but we go through, just so we have some uniform, we know we've given a uniform message, and we um, have each woman go through this with us. And just, I understand that the recommendation in the United States are to not breastfeed. I need to have consistently undetectable viral loads prior to delivery. Uh, even if I maintain an undetectable viral load, there's still a risk of transmitting HIV. In spite of the recommendation, I've decided to breastfeed my baby. I'll exclusively breastfeed. I'll continue to take my medications. I'll have my viral load checked. And if I have a breast infection, I'll not breastfeed from that breast. I may pump milk from that breast, discard it um, until the breast is healed. I'll give my baby two medications for the first six weeks and then continue the prescribed medication until one month after my baby's been fully weaned. I'll bring my baby in for testing as recommended. Um, I'll have a consultation with the pediatrician prior to delivery. Um, when I'm ready to wean, I'll work with the pediatrician. I will openly communicate problems in keeping this contract with my, oh, I, should, I actually should change that, it's really not a contract, um, with my provider and um, I'll bring this um, piece of paper to the hospital where I plan to deliver and give it to the doctors and nurses taking care of me. And so we, um, the, the mother signs, we sign, and then um, the pediatrician sign. And um, one, of, one other reason that we came up with this was there was, we had one patient who did not have an undetectable viral load and never did throughout her pregnancy. Early on, she had expressed an interest in breastfeeding, but when we said, well, once you have an undetectable viral load, we'll talk more about it. Well, next thing she delivered and she announced to the OB team and was our, our residents and um, I wasn't in the hospital at the time she delivered and, and she just said, oh, I'm going to breastfeed. And they thought, oh, hmm, she's one of Dr. Levison's patients. I, I guess it's okay. And um, then the next morning, somebody picked up on this. Wait a minute. I don't think she was such a great candidate. And they called me and we immediately sat down with her and said, wait a minute, this is not a good idea because you, you haven't been able to have an undetectable viral load. And she, once she understood it, she said, OK, that's fine. Um, but we then said, mm, maybe we need some kind of documentation to make sure so people know that if you come with this, it's OK. But if you don't have this, then it probably wasn't discussed. So um that was that was part of why we developed this um then just um a little bit about um hiv negative women um who have partners um with hiv and so the most important is the part that the partner um, be on treatment and have an undetectable viral load and that's called treatment is prevention 
and that's 96 percent plus well it's really we really if you really are um following through it's really 100 percent reduction in, tra in transmission um and then i mean the other is if I mean, and we're especially concerned, and we've seen this, we have three women uh, where this happened, is that if a woman gets uh, infected with HIV while pregnant or breastfeeding, the baby's at very high risk for infection. We had three women who were negative at delivery and acquired HIV while breastfeeding. And one of them knew her partner had HIV, two did not. Um, and, you know, if only we had known the status of those partners, if only we had asked, um, do you, have, you know, what's your partner's HIV status? And if you don't know, what about getting them tested? Um, and so if the couple's not using condoms every time and he doesn't have an undetectable viral load and, and or he's not on medication, then prep for the woman um, during pregnancy and while breastfeeding is highly recommended. And then this was just some of the evidence that um, that PrEP with, um, this was um, heterosexual couples, 90% um, reduction in transmission just by the, the, um, the, the negative partner taking medication. So um, we want to leave time for questions, but I just to, wanted to share with you some final thoughts uh, that one, select women may choose to breastfeed and need to be supported once they make this decision. If clinicians have questions about how to navigate this path with their patients, or you have patients who are trying to figure out how to navigate it with their clinicians, and their clinicians are just saying, we don't do this. Um, clinicians, this is a um, clinician consultation center. The clinician should call the National Perinatal HIV Hotline which is an absolutely amazing service. It's run out of University of California in San Francisco. It's a 24 seven service. So at three in the morning, um, any clinician can call and we'll get a human being on the other end of the line. And um, any question related to someone newly diagnosed in labor and delivery or whatever. And um, the clinicians are extremely knowledgeable. I'm, I think they've seen just about everything and they really welcome calls from clinicians. And then the Well Project is an advocacy organization that supports consumers. So there are a number of women um, who have breastfed who are working with the Well Project and um, are advocates for giving women choice. And so that's a, a great resource for women. And these are just some of our references. And um, and I will tell you actually that the very first one, um, there's sort of a funny story to it. And that was uh, um, two colleagues at University of California, San Francisco and I, were see we were seeing people who wanted to breastfeed and we just decided we were gonna write something about it. And we, had the manuscript, we really hadn't thought about where we were going to submit it. And when we started thinking, we well, we started with an OBGYN journal. And we even talked chatted with the editor ahead of time. She said, mm, this is a little on, you know, a little pushing the envelope, but you know, she said, Well, go ahead and submit it. I'm not saying it'll be accepted, but go ahead. And the reviewers kind of freaked out and they just basically said, No this is completely against United States recommendations and absolutely not. We would never publish something like this. So we were a little taken aback and we thought, well, maybe we're just crazy and let, let's, let's do a reality check. So there's um, a group called Repro ID, also run out of University of California, San Francisco, um, that is group, it's several hundred people now and it's physicians, nurses, um, social workers, case managers, um, just people who are interested in maternal infant care to, related to HIV. And we often use it as a way to, sometimes someone, a clinician will have a question just saying, hmm, I'm not quite sure how to deal with this. And, and it's usually questions where there is no single right answer, but can I just bounce it off the group? And then people who've had experience with it will, will weigh in with their opinions. Oh, this is what I would do in this situation. Oh, and this is what I would do. So we just threw it out to the group and we just said, you know, we wrote this manuscript and it was rejected. And we're just wondering, is this, is this worth pursuing? Should we, should we still try to submit it somewhere else? And we're, is this not 
anybody's experience. And we got so many responses. And one response was from um, Canada, and they said, we just had 75 women get together to discuss this because this has been a major issue for our pregnant women. And then someone else said, well, we just had 200 clinicians get together in New York City. And one of the, the hot topics was exactly this. Now, please try to get it published. And so we did you know, we did pursue it. And um, um, and that was sort of the beginning of, of opening up this subject that had been kind of taboo. So I thank you. And um, these are, I'll just tell you, these are a couple of women who uh, had completed, we are doing group prenatal care, as Irina mentioned in the beginning. And um, these are women who had completed their 10 sessions of group prenatal care. Um, this is for women living with HIV. So thank you, and I welcome your questions. Thank you, Dr. Levison. Um, I learned a lot from your presentation, for sure. Uh, now we have some time to take questions from the audience. And for those that haven't submitted their questions, please feel free to do so. And I see that we have a lot of questions. Um, but again, we won't be able to get to them all, but let's see how many we can get to. Um, okay, so the first, the first question is, um, how do you diagnose HIV if the viral load is undetectable? So explain to us, what does that mean? Ah, okay. So, ooh, okay, great question. Um, most people, there are a few exceptions, will only have an undetectable viral load if they've been on medication. So when, so usually, if someone is first diagnosed, um, there are screening tests, and those are the screening tests we do, um, anyone who, who's coming for an HIV test, pregnant or not. And if the screening, and so if the screening test um, suggests HIV, there's a second test to, to say, let's see, is this for real? And then there's a third test that's really the, the definitive one, and that's a viral load. And so um, most people newly diagnosed have a high viral load or have a significant viral load. And so we might see, and so what they're doing is they're counting how many little bits that copy with the called copies of virus there are in a teaspoon of blood. And so we might see 10,000, we might see 100,000, sometimes we see a million. And um, that's letting you know wh what your starting point is. Um, and so there are some rare people who have some genetic protection against uh, HIV where they do have HIV, but they don't mount a viral load, but by our testing can distinguish that. Um, so basically to make a diagnosis of HIV, it's, it's testing that, that sifts out mostly who has a viral load or who has antibodies to HIV and the only way you get antibodies is having having HIV. And please feel free to ask me more questions about that if that's not clear. No, thank you. That's a great question because for people that aren't in this field, that's a very confusing term to them about being undetectable yet versus detectable and, and the whole breastfeeding conversation. So thank you. Um, there's another question here. Is the viral load or risk of transmission reduced with pumped frozen breast milk? Um, pumped frozen, probably not. Um, there are, are what some women have done, and but it is extremely uh, labor intensive, is what's called flash heating. And that is taking breast, pumping breast milk, um, putting it in a warm water bath, heating it, to boiling for a minute and then letting it cool to room temperature. That does appear to reduce viral load, but freezing, um, there's no evidence. Okay, interesting, thank you. I know that some women do that for, I think, is that what they do for lipase? Like, um, I think they scald the milk for, so I'm wondering if that has to do with the fat cells hmm. that are in the breast milk. Sorry, this is a non, um, lactation person talking, just like I'm trying to piece things together. Thank you. Thank you for answering that. Um, 
another question is, where can we get data regarding HIV mothers who elect to breastfeed and who have, okay, where can we get data regarding HIV mothers who elect to breastfeed and who just have pregnant women who are HIV positive here in the US? So I guess this person is looking for where can she find more information on, on this topic regarding mothers who want to breastfeed um, and those pregnant women who are HIV positive. Okay, so I would go to the perinatal guidelines, and that's the um, www.hivinfo, H-I-V-I-N-F-O, dot N-I-H, dot gov, and what pops up on the first page is guidelines. You click on guidelines, and then you, there are several sets of guidelines. You click on perinatal guidelines. And then in the left-hand column, it gives you some of the subtopics. And there, one says um, individuals with HIV who um, want to breastfeed. And you go to that, and there's a several-page um, um, summary. And it's really, it has the most up-to-date, as of December 2021, so as of a month ago, the most up-to-date um, references. And there's... So far, in the, if we have very little information on women in the U.S., um, there's a group out of Johns Hopkins that just, it's either published or it's going to be published this month um, on 10 women in their um, practice who breastfed and none of whom transmitted. And then, as I said, we are, we are gathering, because nobody has that many, um, some sites have one mom who breastfed, we have maybe about 10. Um, some have more, and so we're, I'm hoping that by the end of 2022, we will have put together all the data from the 8 to 10 sites that we have, and I don't know where, if we're going to have 30, 50, 60 um, cases to report on, but we just at least will be able to describe these were the, the most common reasons that moms chose to breastfeed. These were the the institutions that had policies and these were the institutions that didn't. This is how often viral loads were usually checked. And just to know what is the practice right now, because we really don't know. So just starting. Thank you, look forward to seeing that. Um, let's see another question. Do women with HIV who want to breastfeed have to exclusively breastfeed? Can they combo feed? So again, question of the century. Um, we recommend exclusive breastfeeding because it was shown to be safer before there were anti good antiretrovirals. Um, and because we just don't know. Um, do, you know, are there times that women may mix? Yes, there probably are. Is it okay? We just don't know. And it's probably a very, if there's a risk, it's probably a small risk, but exclusive breastfeeding is what we recommend. Interesting. Thank you. Um, there's a few more questions. Um, I think this one is more of a comment. Um, one of our participants say, quite informative. I did learn a lot. I have worked with some Nigerian centers that report good success with exclusive breastfeeding. In other words, zero transmission rates. While I am still hesitant to do this in the U.S., I would embrace this as an opportunity for good dialogue. Thank you for sharing that. Um, another person shared, well, asked and shared, what is the recommendation for a mother who tests positive for the first time at hospital admission? I once worked with a mother in the hospital who tested positive. She was told she could not breastfeed, but the more sensitive, but the more sensitive test came back negative after she was discharged. I feel awful for her. Okay. No, that's a, then that is something that we see. And so, um, the testing has become, the results come back faster these days than a few years ago. And so if an, the initial, so I'll tell you a little about the testing. Um, what most places are using and what's recommended by CDC. The initial test is called the fourth generation antigen antibody HIV, HIV, uh, HIV-1, HIV-2 assay. And what it is and what makes it special compared to what used to be is it tests for both antibody and the antibody is what, what your body makes after 
being exposed to HIV, but to, before it becomes de detectable in, in blood, it takes a few months. So antibody is going to take a little while. Antigen is a piece of the HIV. And so if somebody has HIV, then this is great for picking up HIV, if, even if it was acquired two weeks ago. So that's the initial screening test. And if that is positive, um, then the Lab, most labs will automatically do the second test. So the second test is the HIV-1, HIV-2 antibody differentiation assay. And so that's an antibody test. So um, that may not pick things, some things up until a little later, but it's the point of it is if you've had HIV for a little while, it will pick it up. There are two kinds of HIV, main kinds of HIV. One is the one that's in most of the world. HIV-2 seen a little bit more in um, West Africa. Um, and so that's, so, and what it tells you, and you, you, the test then says either the antibody for HIV-1 is positive, that means someone has HIV, or it's positive for HIV-2, that means they have HIV, but the other kind. Um, it's negative for both. If it's negative for both, huh, then that's the, that's where there's a bit of a conundrum of, huh, the first test said yes, the second test said no, but the first test was an antigen test, picks it up way earlier. So we need to break this tie. And um, so what is then done is a viral load. And so if you have a positive screen, a negative antibody, you then get the viral load done. And if there's no viral load, it was a false positive. If there is a viral load, it was the real deal. So you usually should be able to get that, all of that within 24 hours. I mean, if, if it's a send out, it may not, but um, the first two tests should be available in any hospital. And so if, if a woman has this where we just, we, we don't know, we need to wait for the viral load to come back, what she can do is pump until there's confirmation. And so that's what we recommend is, you know, you know, you don't have any risk factors. We think this is a false positive. You want to breastfeed. Let's just, yeah, let's just have you um, pump and freeze it until we know. and we should know, you know, within, I mean, in our hospital, we should usually know within a day. Um, some hospitals, again, if it's a send out, maybe a little longer. And I think all of that used to take a lot longer. But I fully understand why you felt ter terrible. Um, but because there can be false, um, false positives. Thank you. Great information and great recommendations. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. Um, can you repeat the name of the test or mention it in the chat? I don't know what test they might be talking about, but maybe you know. Oh, the, the screening test, and it's worth checking with your lab to find out what they're doing, but it's called a fourth generation HIV-1, HIV-2 assay, um, just means test, um, and that's the screening that that is the the fourth generation screening test is what should be done thank you a long time ago and this is just so, what sometimes it gets confusing like over 10 years ago the initial screen was just an antibody test and if it came back positive it then a different antibody test was done called a western blot we don't do that anymore but with the old tests if, so, if it was negative and we were concerned about HIV, people were told, oh, get retested in three months because if you have HIV, it'll show up in three months. But that's no longer true. Now we have these way more sensitive antigen antibody tests that pick it up within two weeks. Great. Thank you. Thank you for repeating that. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, so I know that you talked about, you know, the cultural and component and stigma that exists in certain um, uh, folks when it comes to breastfeeding with HIV. But when talking with perinatal women and individuals living with HIV, how do they often describe their decision making? What are their priorities, concerns about infant feeding apart from, you know, what you mentioned during your presentation? Is there anything else that we should take under mm -hmm. consideration? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yes, we have the stigma issue. <clears throat> we have the the message that breast is best. And we have tons of, of 
evidence that it's better for the mother, less diabetes, things like that. And for the baby, it's better, less, um, fewer allergies, less asthma, um, less obesity, things like that. And so those are huge. And we're kind of putting that to the side. And so that's for some women, it's look, I want to do what, you know, what, what everyone says is best for my baby. They're bonding issues and talking to some women who have were first for one pregnancy were told not to breastfeed and then next one they decided they would. Just the difference in how they how they felt about themselves and um, one woman I talked to recently said she had severe postpartum depression because she couldn't breastfeed and she just felt like she was missing something she was supposed to be doing and she felt like a less than mother. So I think um, yeah, bonding, um, um, just all the physiologic things better for mother and baby. Um, and that's some of what we're also trying to, to collect is find out what are all the reasons because we don't, yeah, we, we, it hasn't been studied well in the U.S. Absolutely. Dr. Levison, thank you so much. I think that uh, was our last question. But before I close out the program, would you mind um, letting the participants know how they can contact you if they have any other questions? Sure. Um, best is my, my email, and that's J Levison. So it's J L E V is in Victor, I S O N, there's no N in the middle, at BCM as in Baylor College of Medicine. Edu. Wonderful. Thank you so much again. So a reminder for our participants that you will receive a link to um, a post-program evaluation. And again, your feedback is very important. So please take, please take the time um, to complete that. And the certificates of completion will be sent via email within about one week. Um, a calendar of the partnership's upcoming virtual programs can be found on our website, www pmch.org um, under the professionals educations have and many events uh, that um, that are we are having especially um, you know we are um, looking towards maternal health awareness day next week so we're going to be um, offering a lot of programs in honoring that um, we also offer on-demand recordings um, of many of our programs as well as um, short 15 minute or less educational videos all of which are listed on our website so if you enjoy this program please go on again to our website to, to see what, what more is there. Um, thank you so much again, Dr. Levison. Thank you um, to everyone that made this program possible.